I'm Mike Ward. I want to take you through a very important topic in terms of corporate finance and economics. We call this the cost of capital. And it's really important that companies understand this and know where it comes from and why it is what it is. If you don't know the cost of your capital, then you're not going to know what sort of return shareholders uh, are anticipating and requiring of the company. You will make wrong decisions in terms of your investments and all kinds of problems. So it is a very important basic number we need to be able to understand. Now, it's often called different things. You'll hear it referred to as the required return by the company. Sometimes it's just called the discount rate. You'll hear it referred to as the hurdle rate, the rate we have to jump over. The, but its proper name is the weighted average cost of capital or sometimes abbreviated to just being the WAC. So to illustrate this, remember companies have got assets on their balance sheet and these assets are funded by capital. And there are two main types of capital here, interest bearing debt, debt is anything that, that costs interest and equity, which is the money that shareholders uh, that is represented by shareholders. Now, let me just quickly mention here that the book value of equity is not the number we're looking for when we are looking at the cost of capital. We are going to use the market capitalization figure, which is likely to be double what's in the balance sheet. And that's for many reasons which are explained on other videos. But we're going to assume that the, the, that the equity is the market capitalization and not the book value. Now, shareholders are going to require a higher uh, return because equity is risky. Uh, there's no guarantee what you're going to get every year, whereas interest has to be paid. If you don't pay interest to the bank, they're going to put you into insolvency. And uh, then they have claim on the assets and the shareholders will get very little, if anything at all, as the company goes into liquidation. So shareholders don't really know what they're going to get. It could be it's going to be volatile up and down, depending on how things go in the year and so on. And because of that, you're going to expect to see the cost of equity is going to be higher than the cost of debt. So that's our starting point. Now, just to give you a quick example of where we're going, let's look at a, a situation in South Africa. We've got some equity, some debt here. I'm going to use some notation here. I'm going to refer to the cost of equity which is remember the required return by shareholders as KE and the cost of debt as just KD. That's what the bondholders want or the bank wants, whoever lent you the money. Now, in South Africa, you're gonna find a reasonable rate if you were to guess what shareholders want, it's gonna be something like 15%. Uh, the bank reasonable rate would be something like 9%. Now, we also need to know the weighting of debt and equity in our, uh, on the capital side of our balance sheet, if you like. And I'm going to assume that we've got a ratio of one lot of debt to two lots of equity. And remember, this is the market capitalization of the, the shares. Now, if we add these together, we're going to get a total uh, value of equity of three. This enables us to see that Debt represents one lot out of three, in other words, one third, and equity represents two lots out of three. We need to know the percentage here. So once we've got that, we can put this together in the form of our weighted average cost of capital. Let's start with the debt. We've got one third of our capital is debt. That's why I'm using that number. Debt costs us 9%, but, and this is the trick, we can actually multiply this by one, one minus 33%, which is the corporate tax rate. And the reason for this is that the bank pays, sorry, the company pays 9% to the bank. The bank receives 9% on its loan, but this uh, interest that's paid is tax deductible. So the, the company actually saves tax on that. And that's what we're taking into account here. 100% minus 33% is, is showing us the 66% that the company is actually paying on this. So we need to do that. 
Now, this is just the cost of debt. We've also got to factor in the cost of equity, and two-thirds of our capital is costing us 15%, so that is why I'm showing that at the end there. Now, we can actually do up with these numbers, uh, made them nice and round, so we can easily do this in our head. Two-thirds of 15 is 10%. That's what equity is costing us based on the proportion of equity we've got here. And this is two-thirds of nine, which is 6%, and one-third of 6% is 2%. So we've got 10% and 2%. This should give us a weighted average cost of 12%. That's where that number comes from. So let's go and talk a little bit more then about the breakdown of these things. The cost of debt, now I'm, I'm moving to, to uh, US dollars over here, um, is, is often uh, determined by the rating agencies. You've heard of these, uh, these companies, Moody's, Standard Poor's, and so on, and the triple A's and triple B's and so on that they come up with here are based on a bunch of criteria that they access and assess in a company. So to give you an example, a triple A rated company might have interest cover of say 15 times, whereas a triple B rated company might have interest cover of four times. So there, there'll be a bunch of metrics that feed into this that the rating agencies assess to determine your, uh, your grade. And if you're triple A, uh, and at the moment, that's probably going to uh, give you a interest rate. This, this is the cost of corporate debt here, the interest rate for companies of about, let's say, 3.9% right now. Right now, 10-year uh, US Treasury bonds are trading at about 3%. So you can get a sense. As, as you are more risky here, obviously, the cost of debt is going to go up. Now, if you've got a rating, you can go and see what the current cost of debt is uh, from the rating agency. And so you know what the cost of debt is. But many times we don't actually know what this is. We don't necessarily have a rating on our company. Certainly for smaller companies, we wouldn't have that. So we, we can also just guess it to some extent. Uh, estimated might be a better word. So let's say the yield on 10-year government bonds in the US is 3.5%. Then we might say, OK, for our company, we need to add a bit to this because it's got more risk than corporate bonds. So let's add another 1% to this. And uh, that's then we, we if the, the corporate tax rate in the US is 20%, our cost of debt after tax is going to be 3.5% plus the extra risk factor that we, we're factoring in here. And we're going to take that after, after tax. And you can see me doing the maths over here. That's going to give us an after-tax cost of debt of about 3.6%. That's the easy part. What about the equity side, though? That's much harder. So we know the cost of debt after tax is 3.6, but we need to get a feel for the cost of equity. If we were in South Africa again, I'm just showing you here that if you had invested one rand in 1960 into the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, including dividends, you would find that your money is worth close to, what is this, something like 10,000 rand. And if you work out the compound average in interest rate here, works out return rather, because this is equity, works out at about 16%. So on average, shareholders have had over the last 60 years about 16%. So we would expect the average company ought to be producing that. Now you can do the same thing in the US. Uh, or other countries and get a feel for what the average return shareholders have got. So it was a good starting point to get a feel for what the cost of equity is. Bonds, you can see, have yielded much less. And we uh, sometimes look at the difference between these two, which in this case is a little bit high, but normally is around about 6%. And you're going to hear us referring to this as the market risk premium. It is the premium you get for investing in risky assets such as shares over bonds, government bonds. So just showing you too that equity is risky. If you looked at monthly returns on the JSE here, they're going to be up and down all the time. If you invested in bonds, you can see it's much less risky. And uh, we, we know that. So 
there's a relationship then between risk and return. And uh, we know that it's possible to get a return without taking any risk. You can, you can invest your money into government bonds. Most governments don't default. This is Venezuela or a few others spring to mind. You're going to be sure you're going to get your money back from the government. And uh, so we, we start by saying that we, there is a positive return available to you from risk-free assets. But if you're going to take on risk, then you should get a higher return, obviously. If you measure risk in a particular way, and we call that beta, then we get, in fact, a straight line relationship, which is really nice because we can start to put a bit of algebra into this. And if we know what the market risk premium is, the extra return on average that you get for investing in the stock market over lending your, mon your money to the government, which I told you just now is about 6%, well, then we can kind of put this all together. So here is a formula. The required return for investors, assuming this constant nice linear growth model here called the capital asset pricing model covered in some other videos is uh, based on your risk-free rate plus the beta, in other words, how far you are on this axis over here times this market risk premium, the slope of the line. And so if you're a risky company like Sasol, for example, which is a petrochemical company, you're going to have a risk factor of maybe 1.8. And we can plug that in and it's going to tell us that shareholders require a return right up here, which is probably going to be close to 20%. If you are a grocery retailer such as pick and pay, you're going to have a beta of about 0.5. And so shareholders are going to want to get, I don't know, much less something more like 12%. And we're just plugging it into this little equation. So you're going to see us doing that right now. It's called the CAPM or the Capital Asset Pricing Model. Now, where do we get these betas from? I'm switching back to US data here and I'm showing you uh, Tesla. And if you go to Yahoo Finance, a uh, nice website for getting all kinds of data, and you just type in Tesla's code over here, you're going to see a whole bunch of data coming up about Tesla. And one of the numbers that's right on the front page here is going to be Tesla's five-year beta. Betas are typically calculated over five years, although they are people who do it differently from time to time. So this is a very high number. This is telling me that investors want more than twice the normal return risk, the normal risk premium that you would get for investing in the US stock market. So that's a pretty uh, risky company. If you were to change this to Shell, somewhat surprisingly, actually, you're getting a beta of 0.79. So that's about 80% of the market risk premium that shareholders want over and above the risk free rate in the US. If you change this to Johnson & Johnson, pharmaceutical company, you can see it's even less risky, as you'd kind of expect. So we can get betas uh, or calculate them ourselves from many places. And uh, there are different ways people like to do this. But once we've got a beta, it's easy for us to plug it into our formula for the cost of equity, which is very simple, the capital asset pricing model. It says, let's do it for Johnson & Johnson. What can you get for free by lending your money to the government? Let's look at Johnson & Johnson's beta and multiply that by the market risk premium. And here I'm just showing you uh, the numbers here, putting it together. And you can see if you do the maths over here, the, um, this is the, uh, we're assuming the, um, the yield on 10-year government bonds. And this is the uh, beta for Johnson & Johnson, and we're multiplying it by 6%. Not sure why I've got two lines doing the same thing here. But this is what shareholders would expect to get for, for investing in Johnson & Johnson. If you invested in Tesla, th this is going to be, what if it was 2 point something, 2.3 times 6%. So it's going to be quite a bit higher than Johnson & Johnson because it's more risky. So once we've got our cost of equity, that's the hard part, then we need to put it all together. 
And here's the formula that we saw a little bit earlier written down for you. We need to get the WAC, we need the proportion of debt times the after-tax cost of debt plus the proportion of equity. And this must add up to 100%. So I'm just expressing it as a percentage here. What is the percentage of debt in the company times the cost of debt? What does the bank want? After tax. Add that to one minus the percentage of debt because either debt or equity normally. And, uh, and what do shareholders want? So plugging in our numbers in this instance over here, we're going to say, okay, the percentage of debt is going to be, let's say, one third times 3.6%. That is the cost of debt after tax that we used, we saw a bit earlier, plus two thirds of the cost of equity, put it all together. And that is going to be our cost of capital, our hurdle rate, our required return, our technically weighted average cost of capital. We're going to use this number to do our usually our NPVs on uh, capital investment projects, assuming that they are as risky as the company is as a whole. So here's a little example for you. And we're gonna do this using South African data here. Imperial is a logistics company, and we've been given some information here. This is the 10 year yield on South African debt. This is the R186, it's a, it's a big um, benchmark government bond. So the cost of debt is for a company is going to be higher than the the you know what you can get um, by lending your money to the government because companies are a little bit more risky. So we've added a one percent uh, premium to this. We've got a beta of 0.85. We know the market risk premium is a constant of around about six percent, and uh, our our target debt to equity ratio is going to be one lot of debt to nine lots of equity. And if the marginal tax rate for companies is 28%, you can work out the whack. You might want to put this video on pause and do that. Well, here's my solution to that problem. You can see I'm working out the cost of equity. I'm getting it at 14.1%. That's the risk-free rate times plus the beta times the market risk premium. I'm using the capital asset pricing model to give me that. And this is the cost of debt, 10%. We're told that. But I'm I need to take it after tax, which I'm doing over here. And But the key thing that people get wrong is the, the uh, weighting of debt and equity. One lot of debt to nine lots of equity means that this is going to be one out of 10. So that's one tenth debt after tax plus nine tenths of the cost of equity is going to give you 13.4%. I hope you got that. Now, if you were to plot the weighted average cost of capital for a company over time, you're going to find that it changes. It goes up and it goes down depending on interest rates, especially, but also depending on what's happening to the company's gearing. Sometimes companies take on more debt to fund projects and sometimes less. And so we need a long-term figure for this. So we're going to take the target capital structure, the what is normal for that company to have in terms of its weighting of debt versus equity. And that might be quite different to what it is at a particular moment in time. So we need to kind of look long-term. And uh, also these rates change, interest rates go up and down. So we want to kind of take an average over a period of time. And I'm just showing you here that we would probably work it out and kind of look at it over a period of time. And in this instance here, we might say for Imperial, it's around about 13%. I hope you found that helpful.